we go. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Harewood, and I'm a professor in the School of Journalism and Communication here at Carleton University. And we are coming to you from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe. Um, I'm honored to be the moderator for this evening's Black History Month event, featuring the distinguished author, journalist, and professor of journalism at Columbia University, Howard French. Uh, this event is hosted by the School of Journalism and Communication in partnership with the Institute of African Studies, the Bachelor of Global and International Studies, and the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. This has truly been a collaborative effort. I'd like to space, pay special thanks to the Journalism School's Director, Alan Thompson, for his work in helping to make tonight's event a reality. And also I'd like to recognize Jenna Lynn Smith, the graduate administrator at the school, whose tireless work behind the scenes has been invaluable. Also, a big thank you to our School of Journalism and Communication colleagues and those of the Faculty of Public Affairs for their support. Uh, it is, of course, the 28th day of February, the final day of Black History Month. And I think in this instance, we really have saved the best for last because Howard French is one of the best. By any measure, Howard French has had one of the more remarkable careers in journalism. He, he came to public consciousness as a reporter and foreign correspondent for the New York Times. He began his career as a freelance reporter for the Washington Post. Uh, he joined the Times in 1986 and worked as a Metro reporter there for three years. And then from 1990 to 2008, he reported overseas for the Times as a bureau chief for Central America and the Caribbean, West and Central Africa, uh, Japan and the Koreas, and also in China. Uh, where he was based in Shanghai. And during this time, he was twice the recipient of an overseas press club award. Between 2005 and 2008, he was a columnist on global affairs for the International Herald Tribune. Howard French's journalism continues to be featured in such publications as the New York Review of Books, the Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian, and The Atlantic Magazine. He's the author of five books, including three, week, three works of nonfiction, and a work of documentary photography. His book, Everything Under the Heavens, How the Past Helped Shape China's Push for Global Power was published in 2017, and it was featured by The Guardian as one of its notable books of the year. His book, China's Second Continent, How a Million Migrants Are Building a New Empire in Africa, was published in 2014, and it was named one of the 100 notable books uh, of 2014 by the New York Times. Howard French is also the author of A Continent for the Taking, The Tragedy and Hope of Africa, which was named Nonfiction Book of the Year by several newspapers in 2004. His latest book is called Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans in the Making of the Modern World, 1471 to the Second World War. The book is a bold, unapologetically ambitious project that sets out to fundamentally reframe our understanding of world history by placing Africa and Africans at the very center of the making of the modern world. Howard French's talk tonight is entitled Born in Blackness. And then following his presentation, the two of us will have a conversation about the book, his career journey. And then thanks to his expertise in global affairs, we will also chat a bit about the current state of geopolitics. Our conversation will be followed by a question and answer session, in which we will take your questions and comments. But without further ado, please welcome to Carlton and to the nation's capital, to Ottawa, Howard French. Howard, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for such a generous um, in, um, introduction, Adrian. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you and with all of you. I'm sorry that uh, it's in this disembodied way. Um, my preference would be to appear before a live audience and to be able to get to know each other that way and to have a, <clears throat> a more uh, intimate kind of exchange. But uh, here we are on Zoom and uh, I'm gonna get right into it. So Adrian, in your uh, presentation of uh, my career and mention of the uh, uh, book's title, uh, you, you emphasized uh, in ways that I found uh, a little surprising, but in the positive sense of the word, Africa and Africans. And this is something I find myself emphasizing constantly when I speak about the book. And I hope to make clear to uh, the audience why both of those words were necessary in the title of the book um, as, as we proceed. Um, I also want to dwell for a moment and in fact begin uh, by talking about what I mean by the making of the modern world. Um, 
modernity is one of these concepts that social scientists love to uh, debate and to split hairs about and to interpret in various ways. I'm going to use uh, this term in a way that will be uh, familiar to the broadest possible audience and, and sort of refer to what uh, the image that I have, not just based on supposition, but actually on, on, on research that I did in the, in the work on this book about how we as Westerners um, typically learn about um, how we arrived in the present moment, uh, how, in other words, the modern world was built. Uh, and this narrative has some very particular features which are seem so permanent as almost to be written in stone. And so I'm gonna to try to, to, to limb some of the principal uh, elements of these features. And I think they'll be familiar to you uh, because they're so near universal. And then I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna to attempt to de deconstruct them a bit in the way that the book itself de deconstructs them or works to deconstruct them. So the modern age in the sort of traditional way uh, we are all taught, even if that word, whether or not that word or that phrase is used, begins, I think, in this notion that Europe, and in specific, a part of Europe called Iberia, and most specifically, a nation in Iberia called Portugal, was obsessed at a particular moment in time with discovering a maritime route to Asia that Asia was thought back then, and we can situate this moment in time in the 15th century, Asia was thought to be the center of action in terms of wealth and uh, sources of uh, lucrative trade goods in the world. Uh, and therefore uh, the Portuguese being a very young and poor kingdom uh, were obsessed according to the standard storylines with finding a way to reach Asia. The Portuguese being on the Western side of the Iberian Peninsula didn't have direct access to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the Spaniards of course occupied the, the Mediterranean facing portion of Iberia. The Spaniards and the Portuguese, I'm calling them Spaniards. Spain actually didn't exist as an entity yet, but for, con for, for conversation's sake, uh, let's call the kingdoms that occupied what are now what is now modern Spain, Spain, right? So the Spaniards controlled access to the Mediterranean and this forced the Portuguese to look uh, westward uh, and southward uh, for a route to Asia, we are told. And this is the motor that drives the creation of the modern world. And this creation of the modern world reaches its, um, its um, uh, satisfaction or its completion with the most uh, famous act of the age, uh, ironically not an act uh, carried out by a Portuguese or at the behest of the Portuguese, and that is Columbus's discovery of, of quote unquote discovery of the Americas. Columbus, as we all know, uh, <clears throat> travels westward uh, out of the belief, uh, which was a novel, a novel belief in this era for Europeans that the world was not flat, but was indeed round, and that if he traveled west, he could find um, his way to Japan and to China and beyond, right? So what is it about this story that is worth deconstructing? And why is this important? And what does this deconstruction tell us about the modern world or its creation? And how does this um, uh, deconstruction or the deconstruction that, that I offer in the book and which I promised to sort of offer you a flavor of in this conversation, how does it put Africa at the center of, 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 of this story where I believe it belongs to me? Um, <clears throat> one has to go back uh, a century and a half or more prior to Columbus to inspect or to contemplate uh, or assess events that were taking place in a region of Africa that we now know of as the Sahel. The Sahel is a broad band of uh, savanna-like territory uh, that goes from west to east across Africa, south of the immediate to the immediately to the south of the Sahara Desert, in the western part of the Sahel, uh, corresponding with the nation that is the modern nation of Mali, was the heartland of a series of great empires going back to early in the first millennium. Uh, we're not going to take this conversation quite that far back. We will, though, begin early in the 14th century, meaning in the early 1300s when a king of, or an emperor, depending on which terminology one favors, of the emperor, empire of Mali, named Abu Bakr II, gets uh, uh, it into his head 
a century, more than a century and a half before Columbus did, that there are lands to be discovered on the far side of the Atlantic Ocean. The Malians being a Muslim empire in this era, or at least the elite of this empire in this era, um, had a tradition of pilgrimage to Mecca and of contact with the Arab world. Um, and by virtue of this contact with the Arab world of what we now know of as the Middle East, they had access to Islamic learning in the Middle East. And since the eighth century, uh, Islamic geographers had already posited that the world was round and had, had developed centuries um, uh, before uh, Europeans quite a sophisticated understanding of the true geography of the world, even if they had not explored the Western shores of the Atlantic. So it's not as fanciful or even as surprising uh, as it might seem on the face of it that an African might have wondered what exists on the other side of the modern world. Abu Bakr II, this emperor, doesn't just wonder this. He, he mounts two expeditions. Uh, not involving tall masted ships with which West Africans did not possess in this era, but very large and sophisticated dugouts, a technology that was common in West Africa and was mastered in West Africa in this era to, to a high level of sophistication. The first of these ventures sets out at sea and most of the boats never return. The leader of that expedition comes back, he presents himself before the king, he describes violent ocean currents that, that uh, tore the boats apart and sunk them at a certain point where two seas seemed to converge, one from the north, one from the south. This is a very important datum, a very important piece of information that should, that, that, that enhances the veracity or the, the, the believability of this story. And I'll tell you why we know this story in a moment. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But, but the existence of violent currents that come together at a certain point in the ocean at that latitude to the west of Mali was something that Columbus would discover later on. And the, the, the pertinent current in particular that's worth noting, we now know of as the Canary Current, which at a certain latitude begins not to push traffic back toward Europe, which has, had been what had impeded European ocean exploration in previous ages, but just to the south of those seas that push eastward back to Europe exist currents that push strongly to the west and therefore lead to uh, the so-called new world. So there's a record of Africans having understood this in the early, the very beginning of the 1300s. Abu Bakr is a determined man. He uh, is, receives the report of the person he had charged with this expedition of the disaster. And he says, I'm gonna do this myself. We're gonna assemble even more boats and we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, commandeer or, or, or lead this expedition. This leader, Abu Bakr II, never returns to, uh, to coastal Africa. I'm not here to, to argue, uh, and nor have I in my book, that he ever made it to the New World. There are people who, who, who speculate about such things. I don't find that to be terribly fruitful. Uh, what's interesting to me is has to do with the way that Africa has been typically depicted in the accounting of the emergence of the modern world. And this is actually the sort of founding act in the erasure of Africa from, 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 from a, a narrative that is now 600 years old. There is a history of Africans trying to cross the Atlantic that far predates the history of Europeans trying to cross the Atlantic. The next question we have to ask ourselves is what makes this not simply just a matter of idle curiosity or, or kind of a, a Jeopardy quiz question or something like that? And the answer is also has to do with erasure, but it finally has to do with the events that followed. So on the erasure side, uh, first of all, we are told when we are not told directly, we are told by implication that Africans have never been players of any significance or note in world history, that they are basically absent from the story. Um, great Western thinkers, and I could cite quite a few of them, perhaps the most famous of them is Hegel, who basically said Africans live outside of history. History has nothing to do with Africans. There is no history in Africa. Okay, um, this leader, Abu Bakr II, who almost certainly perished at sea trying to uh, reach the far shores of the Atlantic out of the belief that the earth was round, was not just trying to, to explore the ocean. He was acting out of geopolitical ambition. 
in my view. And I'll tell you why I believe this in a moment. Uh, my theory, as I elaborate in this book, is that Mali was and had been for a long string of centuries already the most important source of gold in world trade uh, in Africa and Europe, was looking for new outlets for its gold. Uh, the reason it sought new outlets for its gold is because Mali's gold had traditionally been traded across the Sahara and had to pass through the hands of middlemen in uh, Arabic speaking North African kingdoms who took big cuts as they, as all middlemen tend to do, as they passed the gold onward into Europe in trade with Europeans. And so the Malians frustrated, I believe, by the loss of uh, those margins to the middlemen were seeking under Abu Bakr II a, a, a way to discover other outlets for their immense stores of gold. So we know this story for the following reason. In 1324, Abu Bakr II's successor, a man named Mansa Musa, who even who survives in popular culture uh, or at the fringes of popular culture, um, not everybody heard, has heard about him, but you can encounter mentions of him here and there on the internet uh, with the reputation in, in such circles as the world's richest man ever. Right, Abu Bakr II's successor, this world's richest man, was a man named Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa in 1324, uh, the emperor of Mali, sets off on another great geopolitical gambit across the Sahara Desert to Egypt and to Mecca. His ultimate destination is to pay is for to um, uh, to um, uh, an act of pilgrimage to Mecca, but he stops uh, with an enormous procession. Uh, in Cairo, where he stays at the foot of the Great Pyramids uh, for a series of weeks. And in his possession with this great cat convoy of, that he traveled with over 3,500 miles, he carried with him 18 tons of pure gold. Uh, these 18 tons of pure gold during his stay were unbelievably completely distributed, exhausted in acts of patronage and religious devotion. Mansa Musa handing out gold to officials high and low and to religious figures in the Muslim world of Egypt under the Mamluk dynasty and in uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, mom, uh, just uh, to uh, sort of tie a knot on Abu Bakr II, we know the story of his predecessor because during a session with the Mam Mamluk governor of Cairo, Mamluk, uh, I'm sorry, um, Mansa Musa is asked for the history of his dynasty in a court session with the leader of Mamluk Egypt. And Abu Bakr, I'm sorry, Mam, uh, Mansa Musa describes this history of Abu Bakr trying to cross the Atlantic with, the, with a lot of gold in, in his boats, with the belief that the earth is round and that he can reach the other side of the ocean. So this was, tr this was transcribed by a court scribe in real time in 1325. Uh, in documents that survive. Um, and so that's the basis for understanding this first gambit. The second gambit becomes important, meaning the gambit of Mansa Musa himself, because <clears throat> the quantity of gold that he distributed in Cairo, <clears throat> excuse me, and beyond was such that the traditional ratios of value between gold and silver, historically speaking, in most parts of the world, the most traditional stores of value and of and of uh, and of uh, uh, bases of of metals. Uh, I'm sorry, of money. The traditional ratio whereby gold is often several multiples the price of silver reverses. So much gold had flooded the market under Mansa Musa that gold becomes cheaper than silver in Egypt. <clears throat> the price of gold in the broader Mediterranean world uh, collapses for a decade or more. And word of this enormous, this prodigious amount of wealth controlled by one man spreads very quickly into Europe, far into Europe. <clears throat> and as it spreads, this captures the imagination of the young Portuguese dynasty, which had just been born around that time, known as the Aviz dynasty, the, the beginnings of Portugal. <clears throat> and the Portu Portuguese being very weak and new as a dynasty on the Iberian Peninsula, had founded their, their dynasty by breaking away from control of, from, from what we will call for convenience sake now, the Spanish. And the Spanish being much larger and more prosperous, coveted uh, reconquest of the Portuguese. And so the Portuguese 
are desperate by the early 1400s to figure out a way to acquire the wherewithal to assure their survival vis-a-vis -vis the hostile uh, Spanish. And a prince of the Avis dynasty in the early 1400s, then who history has uh, um, uh, made familiar to us under the name um, Henry the Navigator, um, uh, creates um, a venture of his own. It's actually somehow like a faint echo of what I said about Abu Bakr II. He says that the future of the, his kingdom of the Avis dynasty is should is bound up in whether or not the Portuguese can become the first Europeans to discover the source of the gold at this prodigious amount of gold known to exist since the early 1300s in West Africa. Uh, in the meantime, I skipped a little step. In the meantime, after in the decades following Mansa Musa's pilgrimage, map making in Europe becomes increasingly more speculative and focused on Africa itself. So the traditional narrative that we have of the age of discovery typically starts with Columbus or when not with Columbus himself, with Portuguese explorers like Vasco da Gama or Bartolome Diaz. And as, and, and as these storylines are developed, Africa, if it appears, if the word Africa appears at all in these narratives, it appears in the form of, or to be described as a geographic obstacle that had to be overcome. That Africa, that the quest, the obsession of these Iberians was how to finally somehow circumnavigate Africa. In other words, how to get around Africa and to com so, and, and thereby, for the purposes of narration of these accounts, to completely cut Africa out of the story. You can see from the telling that I've just provided you, just of the beginnings of this, this history, how, how false that is, how unfounded this is. The Portuguese obsession was in fact completely bound up in questing for discovery in Africa. And Henry the Navigator, beginning in the 1430s, mounts these voyages, which I have said somehow faintly echo Abu Bakr's, where he, he finances expeditions, naval explorations or maritime explorations of the African coast, pushing further and further south, looking desperately for the source of gold out of the belief that this is the key to Portugal's survival as a kingdom. Um, uh, so this is the opposite of Africa not being of interest to the Europeans because this pursuit lasts decades, precisely. Port Henry the Navigator begins these efforts in the 1430s. No gold in any uh, interesting commercial quantities is discovered right away. The Portuguese persist and they sort of inch their way down the West African coast little by little, starting, let's say, in Mauritania and Senegal, and finally working their way around the grand bulge of West Africa until they do finally discover gold in the year 1471, a year that appears in the title of my book. Um, uh, <clears throat> when the Portuguese arrive uh, at the place where they discover gold, which is in the modern nation of Ghana, at a place they came to uh, name a uh, know of as, or which, uh, to which they gave the name Elmina, uh, they discovered to their astonishment and delight that even common people, gold was so abundant, even the relatively poor people of this culture wore abundant amounts of gold as adornment on their bodies and in their clothing and in their hair, et cetera. And so the Portuguese established themselves uh, in a trade with these peoples, um, relatively minor kingdom, historically speaking, in that part of Ghana. And I, it's important to note that they established themselves in trade and not in conquest because the Portuguese didn't have the means to conquer these people, even though we're talking about a relatively minor people um, or minor kingdom. Uh, the technological gap between Iberia and West Africa at this time was not especially large. Uh, and the Portuguese didn't have the ability to project force uh, to the extent that would be necessary over such distances to conquer anybody. And so they set themselves up in trade with these West Africans in Ghana for the, the gold that they had been seeking for so long. By the way, by this time, Henry the Navigator is dead. So the Portuguese, he sets, he establishes this quest. It, it goes on for several decades and it survives him. That's how important connecting with Africa had been for the Portuguese. Uh, the Portuguese discover um, to their delight that the Ghanaians are willing to trade uh, with them for gold, but to their dismay that the Portuguese had nothing that the Ghanaians wanted. 
the Portuguese, the Ghanaians, the Portuguese had a, a relatively poor material culture. Their only major economic products at this time were dried fish, salt, and cork, the cork of the stuff that we used to stop our wine bottles. Those were the major products of Portugal. The Ghanaians had no use for those products. The Ghanaians were very hospitable to them, you know, gave them samples of the gold and trade for whatever knickknacks the Portuguese had. And the Portuguese had to go back to Europe to establish new circuits of trade within Europe that become historically quite important and are also traditionally heavily de-emphasized in accounts of the emergence of the modern world. So what do I mean? I mean, mean that the Portuguese, in order to secure trade with what we're going to call Ghana, had to source goods in other parts of Europe, um, starting up new economic circuits within Europe that had not existed before to acquire in places like Germany and the Low Countries, metal wares and textiles that the, the Africans in Ghana would be interested in trading for gold. And so this is the first of, we're all familiar, I assume, with this phrase, triangular trade. This is the first triangular trade that exists with, between Europe and Africa long before the discovery of the New World or before, obviously, the transatlantic slave trade with which the triangular trade phrase is most, most associated. Uh, the Spanish uh, get wind of the Portuguese uh, great success in establishing this trade in gold. In fact, Portugal's crown revenue increases, uh, comes to consist within five years or so, 30% of its crown revenue is suddenly derived from trade with this one place in Africa. Uh, this source of gold was considered so important to the Portuguese that they named their treasury. The kingdom's treasury was named for Africa. It came to be called the Casa da Guinea, meaning the House of Guinea. Guinea was a generic name for sub-Saharan Africa used by the Portuguese in this, in this period. And so this is, we're giving you the antithesis of this traditional narrative, which has cut Africa out of every element of this story. And we haven't even gotten to Columbus yet uh, in terms of his grand, uh, most famous uh, uh, exploration or discovery. So let's do that now. <clears throat> what does this have to do? How does this undermine or how does this uh, complicate the normal story about Columbus? Columbus, in fact, was essentially a mercenary. He was a ship captain for hire. He didn't matter to him which flag he worked for, as long as, you know, the income was sufficient. And so in this period, meaning for two decades, Columbus was in the employment of the Portuguese for the purposes of ferrying this new triangular uh, trade circuit of goods back and forth between Europe and West Africa, between Elmina, this spot where the Portuguese had by this time established the first tropical fortified outpost of any European country, uh, a fort in other words, which they built on the coast of, of present day Ghana in 1482. Columbus spent two decades going back and forth uh, at, in the employment of the Portuguese to supply this fort with trade goods and to bring gold back to Europe. Uh, two other of the great explore, explorer names of this period also did, Vasco da Gama, who I mentioned earlier, and Bartolomeu Diaz also all worked in the employment of the Portuguese. Where this becomes really interesting is <clears throat> that the Spanish in the late 1470s, uh, prior to the construction of this first Portuguese or first European fortified outpost or fort in the tropics, the Spanish being much bigger with much larger naval forces, much more powerful country, tried to seize control of this gold trade away from the Portuguese. They sent an enormous convoy of ships down the African coast to Elmina and tried to uh, defeat the Portuguese at sea to take over the, this trade in gold. But the Portuguese, although much weaker and uh, with a much smaller sort of naval uh, forces, had intelligence about the Spanish uh, um, uh, bid to oust them. And so they lay in ambush and they sunk the Spanish ships uh, and managed to hold on to this um, uh, uh, a vitally important trade outpost to, for, for their um, kingdom. The Columbus, I'll just say one more thing about Columbus, then I have to move on to, to something else, which is of much more obvious importance, I think, or will be much more obvious uh, of importance to, to your audience in terms of the grand sweep of this history. But I've just gotten us going. But, but um, <clears throat> Columbus, it is important to understand had spent 
much of these two decades I've spoken about in his free time, wandering the courts of Europe, trying to persuade people to back him in a venture to try to do what Abu Bakr II had done in the early 1300s, to cross the Atlantic in the discovery, in pursuit of discovery of new lands and hopefully of, of Asia. And he had been laughed out of court in one place after another. The Spanish had turned him down. The English had turned him down. The Portuguese had turned him down. Possibly others had turned him down. When the Portuguese hit the jackpot in terms of establishing this enormously lucrative trade with, with, with what we're calling Ghana, the Spanish then decided out of envy to back Columbus. They said, well, if the tropics can, if there's gold in tropical places like this, we can't let Portugal run away with all of the, the loot, uh, speaking uh, colloquially, right? We have to get into this game too. And so it's at that point that the Spanish reconsider and backed Columbus's ventures. This is the origin of how Columbus a, mastered sea navigation. He was going back and forth to West Africa and understanding the Canary Current, and B, found backing for the great voyages of discovery that he would later make. All of these events have their roots in West Africa. So what were the Portuguese doing in the meantime? The Portuguese believed, much as the Spanish did, that the distribution of gold and silver and precious metals uh, in the world since it had been discovered in such high quantities in Ghana, maybe had something to do with geographic distribution and that at certain latitudes on either side of the equator, close to the equator, there, they had this theory that there must be lots of gold. This was another sort of propelling force behind Columbus's discoveries. He thought that at such latitudes, he would be able to discover gold because the Portuguese had at similar latitudes. Okay, so the Portuguese, not instead of running onward to Asia, which is the normal story we are told, obsessed with getting to Asia, Africa is a mere obstacle. The Portuguese began begin out of this theory of uh, sort of the geographic distribution of gold in the tropics, exploring other parts of Africa nearby. And they would do this for the next two decades prior to any attempt whatsoever of reaching Asia. So we're, try, we're told that Asia is everything, but nobody has paused to say, well, if Asia is everything and they finally have the ability to master sea navigation at great distance from Europe, why is, why is it that they were hanging around in Africa not trying to get to Asia? Uh, and the, the, the reasons for that are quite interesting and not just interesting, important, decisive in understanding the beginnings of the modern age. So the Portuguese um, in uh, uh, a few years after establishing the trade with, with uh, Elmina in Ghana are continuing to explore, looking for gold at those latitudes and off the coast of Central Africa, right on the equator virtually, they discover an island which we call, uh, know of as Sao Tome. Sao Tome is absent from most books of world history or of the start of the modern age, but I want to argue to you is the site of the most important innovation, economically speaking, in the history of the modern age prior to uh, the Industrial Revolution. So why do I say this? The Portuguese, just before the discovery of Sao Tome, had begun very recently experimenting in the, in the farming of sugarcane and in the production of refined sugar far to the north in the Atlantic in places like Madeira and in the Canary Islands. Uh, and they were eager to produce sugar because sugar was a, an exorbitant luxury item that only so rare that it could only be consumed by the richest people in Europe. And so the Portuguese saw a potential for great profit in producing refined sugar, which 99% of Europeans never ever tasted, right? And so the Portuguese arrive in Sao Tome, tropical island, volcanic island, right on the equator, uh, 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 irrigated with uh, seasonal rains of great abundance, and somebody gets the bright idea to try to plant some seed, some uh, saplings of sugarcane or seedlings of sugarcane, and it just explodes. It proves to be, ecologically speaking, pretty much the perfect place to grow sugar. There's only one thing that's missing. The one thing that's missing is labor. Sugar everywhere it has been grown in world history has been associated with forced labor, if not forced labor with outright slavery. And that is because the conditions under which sugar thrives are quite particular. It can only grow or it can only be grown profitably if planted very densely in a place, in a tropical place with abundant rainfall. 
And the, the sugar is sugar is a type of grass, but it's a very specific type of grass with extremely sharp leaves. And so to plant this crop, you have to wander in, in uh, rich, muddy soils in the tropics, inundated with rain, and the whole time you're being cut, you're being sliced up by the leaves of the plant because they're planted so densely together. And so this is why sugar has been, even prior to the stories that I'm telling you, long associated with slavery or with prison labor or other kinds of forced labor. And the Portuguese then begin to bring Africans uh, who they have uh, bought, they have, caught, they have captured in some instances or purchased from parts of the West African or nearby Central African coast to Sao Tome. And this, it is in this place and this specific place and time that this ultra important economic institution, I've called it an innovation, even though it's a horrible innovation, the plantation emerges in its full form. The plantation that would so characterize the later takeoff, economically speaking, of, of uh, European colonialism in, in the Western hemisphere is born on Sao Tome, a place that almost, that typically goes unmentioned in the history books. Um, <clears throat> South, uh, plantation agriculture or the plantation, I, I believe very strongly, is a word that we need to work our way away from, that we need to uh, complicate or reject ultimately. Uh, and, and that is because it is such a euphemism. I think that the, a better, a more accurate way to think of a plantation, this new institution, this new innovation is more akin to a prison industrial labor camp. In other words, the, the enslaved people are in effect prisoners. They're working under high quasi-military supervision. They're being corporally punished constantly in order to eke ever-increasing production out of them. And in fact, they're being worked to death. They're being worked to death as part of the, not by, as a byproduct, but it's the actual business plan of the plantation. Plantations, this prettified term of the plantation, starts out with the idea that the lives of the people who are being put to work in these prison industrial labor settings are utterly dispensable. And in fact, the life expectancy of enslaved peoples in Sao Tome, and then subsequently in the so-called new world, wherever sugar comes to be grown, is between five and seven years, meaning from the moment that you started work under conditions of enslavement until your death, is going to be on average five to seven years. That's how brutal the work um, regime was. Okay, so this all comes together on Sao Tome, but there's another very particular feature, a historically decisive feature associated with, and that is that not just anybody is a slave or is, or is eligible for enslavement, but people of a specific race are equated with eligibility for slavery. In other words, their racial identity automatically subjects them in the thinking of Europeans to the legitimate subjugation into slavery. And their race is, as you all will know and won't have much time, much difficulty guessing, was African, or as we would say in contemporary parlance, black. That blackness becomes equated for the first time with slavery in an absolute way in the minds of Europeans for the purposes of the development of this business model, this innovation, as I've spoken of it, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, prison labor industrial camp settings aimed at producing refined sugar from sugar cane, grinding lives uh, uh, into the ground in remarkably short period of time, five to seven years on average for individuals. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, we could spend a whole hour talking about this institution and maybe, you know, um, uh, those of you who are interested in this will read the book and, and, and I go into this in much greater length in, in its pages. But the other feature that we can't um, uh, neglect to, to describe is uh, a, a familiar term to many of you, which is chattel. So it's not only that Africans are the people who have been enlisted uh, in the minds of Europeans as the legitimate uh, targets of enslavement. But th it's a new, historically speaking, in world historical terms, it's a new form of enslavement. The racial basis of the slavery is new, 
but there's something else that is also new and that and this is where we we this sort of revolves around the meaning of the word chattel chattel has the same root as the latin word for cattle and that's no accident or coincidence uh, chattel slavery meant and means the reduction of these peoples who have been enlisted for the purposes of, of extracting labor from them under militarized conditions uh, to bestiality. And as with beasts, this means that slavery is transgenerational, that not only are the people who are caught up in the enslavement in the present moment going to die as slaves, but that if they should be productive, meaning fecund, meaning if they should reproduce and have offspring, that their offspring will automatically become slaves and become the property, indeed the capital of the owners of the plantation, and that their offspring's offspring will become uh, slaves on and on in perpetuity. This is new in world historical terms. And so all of this comes together in Sao Tome for the first time. Uh, and by a matter of geographic and sort of navigational accident, it transits the Atlantic in the early decades of the, of the 16th century, meaning the early 1500s, when Portuguese discover Brazil. They discover Brazil not because they were looking for it, but because they had discovered a navigational technique for, they were, they were not trying to get to Asia, they were still working very hard to explore Africa, looking for gold elsewhere. And they discovered a navigational technique which, whereby to get down the coast of Africa, they found that it was much quicker, not instead of hugging the coast, to sail out to the west far at sea and then cut back in, like pursuing the leg, uh, this, the next leg of a triangle. And by forming these larger and larger triangles of navigation, they ultimately sailed so far to the west at that latitude brazil is actually not so far distant from central africa but they sailed so far to the west that they hit, hit brazil eureka they've discovered a new continent and and so almost immediately the chattel slavery prison industrial labor camp um, uh, system transits the atlantic with them with a little twist the brazilian i'm sorry the portuguese initially try to enslave the abundant na native american population but these people die off. They also resist and die off in very large numbers, mostly for reasons of disease transmission. Uh, and then <clears throat> sort of mid 16th century, we see the full flush of the transatlantic slave trade for the first time. And this is happening simultaneously in the Spanish colonies of Cuba and of Mexico and of Hispaniola, where for the first time, large numbers of Africans are being brought across the sea in chains by the Europeans for the purposes of extracting labor from them in the settings and through this innovative institution that I've described for you. I'm gonna to try to go really quickly now because I've, 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 I, I wanna save enough time for, for discussion, but I wanna, in, in, in the concluding parts of my opening remarks, I wanna sort of, you know, we all think we know the broad outlines of the story of slavery. You might not, you might have a number in your mind, how many slaves, you know, were landed in the new world. Uh, you might have kind of a, a rote kind of junior high or high school notion of how important this was, economically speaking, to Europe or to the new colonies of Europe in the new world. <clears throat> I want to challenge your sense of knowledge about how important this was. The most famous stories of wealth creation in this age, meaning in the 16th century, are the stories that we uh, that come down to us of Spanish conquest. The conquistadors, these small bands of men in armor and horseback who ride into the teeth of the great empires of native peoples in, in, in the new world and conquer them. And in the next breath, we hear uh, of their carting off enormous stores of gold or silver back to, to Spain and how this creates literally the century that is known for Spain of the, the golden century uh, because of the, the metals that were carted back in boats uh, that were specially designed for this passage, th this uh, function fat-bellied ships called galleons, which were the, the supercargoes of the day, right? So this is the story we understand. This is the traditional story of the great boom in wealth that, that Europe acquired in this age that actually, you know, so this is the era when Europe first starts to diverge uh, in wealth from other parts of the world, always having trailed previously India and China uh, for a long string of centuries. In fact, the slave industrial, this prison industrial labor system based on sugar, but 
later adding on other crops, a series of other crops, and we can get into what those crops were. And I'm going to mention prominently one of them in a few minutes. Um, already in the late beginning, between the late 16th century and the middle 17th century, already agriculture from enslaved Africans is producing for Europe more wealth than the Spanish gold and silver. The Spanish gold and silver is the famous story. The African story is the anonymous story, the story that gets left out of this account, these accounts because there are no grand European figures and there's actually nothing to be proud of, right? Um, I, I, and so <clears throat> this is documented in my book. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, the, uh, uh, solid, you know, financially based assessments of how much wealth was derived from what type of, of of imperial activity by different nations, it is clear that already in Brazil, more money is being made from African labor than the Spanish were able to steal in terms of gold and silver from uh, the New World. Then begins a really interesting transit. So <clears throat> in 1630, England takes over the island of Barbados. Barbados had been uninhabited at that time. Uh, and seeing uh, the great wealth of Spain and Portugal in this era, copies Portuguese techniques in Barbados and in a very a remarkably short period of time. Uh, so the, the English show up in 1630, by 1650, uh, their business model is almost identical to the Portuguese business model. Chattel slavery, prison, industrial uh, labor camps, uh, sugar. In the second half of the 17th century, on the island of Barbados, Britain gets onto its feet as an imperial power for the first time. This is the start of British empire. And Britain earns more money in the second half of the 17th century in this one place, grinding, uh, rubbing out the lives of hundreds of thousands of Africans in the pursuit of the production of sugar than the Spanish had, had, had acquired in, in, in Bolivia and Peru or Mexico. Barbados, to give you an extent of how extraordinary this is, is the size of, is equivalent to the size of one third of the, the surface area of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, one sixth of Long Island, I'm from New York. So one sixth of Long Island here in New York, it's a tiny place. In that tiny place, this model produces that much wealth, more wealth than the conquistadors and the Spanish galleons of the age of gold in Spain had been able to achieve. This is Britain, it's still England, by the way. This is the start of England as a power. It begins in, <clears throat> excuse me, it begins in Barbados. And then both the English and the French are racing to catch up with the Portuguese and the Spanish. And the, the Spanish having these vast territories that they controlled in the Americas and the larger islands of the Caribbean had neglected the smaller islands of the Caribbean, the lesser Antilles. The Spanish had vast naval forces. The English and the French in this time are far weaker. And so the Spanish have left the Lesser Antilles, and as the English were doing this in Barbados, the French begin to exploit under the same model, uh, Guadeloupe and, 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 and Martinique to produce sugar with very similar results. And this moves like a chain up the arc of the Caribbean. The English, once they get the wealth of out of Barbados and Africans producing sugar for them there, they have the wherewithal to take on the Spanish and they beat the Spanish to take over Jamaica. Jamaica is a much bigger island than Barbados. Uh, the wealth creation explodes for England in this period uh, even further. Um, and the, then the French, the you know, envious of the success of the of the of by this point, the British <coughs> then <coughs> create a sugar colony out of their holdings on Hispaniola, the western third of the island of Hispaniola. The other third is controlled by Spain. And between 1730, when the French first started to grow sugar on Hispaniola till the 1780s, or, or by the 1780s, Hispaniola, I'm sorry, Saint-Domingue, the name of the French colony, becomes uh, the, the source of one third of all of France's external trade. This one place, which we know of as Haiti, it is the source by virtue of this economic model, this horrible innovation that I've spoken to, the source of one third of all of the external trade of France. This is France's golden century. This is the century when France really rises to great uh, wealth and power in Europe. And it is on the backs of this model that this all happens. 
Um, <clears throat> In 1791, uh, decisive world historical events take place in that uh, setting. Uh, Africans, and I'm calling them Africans. I told you I would emphasize Africans in the, uh, in the beginning of this talk. Africans rise up against the French and against their bondage. I'm calling them Africans because if the life expectancy is five to seven years from time of arrival, then anybody who arrived and was put to work growing sugar on that island would be culturally the same person that they were when they arrived, you know, when they arrived. In other words, the French were bringing people deliberately, as were the English, wherever they had plantation colonies, from disparate parts of Africa, hoping to forestall uh, concertation and conspiracy among them to pursue their own liberty and rebel. Despite that, the Africans in 1791 rise up in rebellion against the French. And, and some of the most remarkable events in world history proceed from that. Um, <clears throat> the Africans successfully overthrow French rule. Then come the Spanish thinking, oh, if the French have been defeated, we can take over the rest of the island. We already have two thirds of it. The Africans defeat the Spanish. Then come the British. The British say, ah, this is, ready for our plucking. We, we somehow neglected to control the most, the richest sugar growing area of the entire Caribbean. The French got it. Now the French lost it. We should take it. The, French, the, the British send the largest naval convoy in their history to try to defeat the Africans of Saint-Domingue and the Africans win. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 this is not emphasized in major um, histories of the modern era, certainly not in standard curricula. The British lost more soldiers trying to take Saint-Domingue by a very large distance than they lost in the vastly more famous American Revolution. Um, the Africans defeated the, the British. Then the French come back one more time uh, under Napoleon and tried to restore slavery uh, in uh, Hispaniola in Saint-Domingue and the Africans win yet again. And so the Africans win three times, actually four times against the three great empires of the modern age. Uh, each time they win and in the fourth time, the ultimate time defeating Napoleon, uh, a series of absolutely extraordinary things happen. First, we see the very first en true enactment of the most central values of the enlightenment. It is in Haiti among Africans from the very birth of their republic in their founding document, their constitution, that the most central value of the enlightenment is instituted and becomes a, 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 a character of law, takes on the character of law that all people are created equal. We think of that phrase in terms of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. The American Revolution is earlier, but as we all know, all people were not created equal uh, in the American Revolution. Uh, this takes force in Haiti for the very first time in world history. Uh, and, and, and this should give you pause to understand, this, this, this fact alone should give you pause to, under, to, to contemplate uh, the sort of um, trivialized ways uh, in which the, the, the participation of Africans in world history uh, uh, is uh, operated. Um, but in the interest of time, we have to move on to the final sort of chapter of this story. And that is that uh, Napoleon, by virtue of trying to hold on to Haiti and conquer, uh, put down the slave revolt twice, uh, nearly bankrupts France. And by virtue of nearly bankrupting France, he is forced to sell his holdings in North America, in continental America, actually in the United States. Uh, and he sells a vast territory, which we know of as the Louisiana Purchase. This is all or part of 15 American states. It doubles the size of the United States overnight under the Thomas Jefferson administration. And something else very special happens. American politics, meaning the politics of the United States had been dominated by the states of the old South, the plantation, the prison industrial labor system South up until that point. And the conservative uh, founding generation of leaders who ruled in the South took horror at the events of Haiti, thinking that if the slaved, enslaved Africans could defeat the three great imperial powers of the world on, on the island of Hispaniola, maybe they can defeat um, 
our enslavement of Africans on the American mainland. Therefore, we must disperse these people and, and, and reduce their concentrations in our midst and put them to work in other parts of our vast new territory. So the Louisiana Purchase isn't just a geographic kind of um, uh, boondoggle for the young United States, but it becomes a political boondoggle for the founders of the Old South, where they think of themselves as being able to distance themselves from the peril, the perceived peril of a slave uprising. And so they send a million African descendants of Africans on a trek by foot across the vast expanse of the United States to the Mississippi Valley and put them into the production of cotton, the new king commodity of the era, uh, under the same uh, economic institution that we see emerge that we saw emerge in Sao Tome and to the most stunning historic effects so far in this entire narration of stunning economic events. In the Mississippi Valley from the 17 early 1790s when no cotton was grown uh, until the Civil War in the United States, well actually by six by, by 1830 cotton was the already by 1830, starting from zero in 1790, by 1830, cotton was the principal economic, I'm sorry, trade export of the United States by a long distance. Uh, by um, the 1830s, the production of cotton in this prison industrial labor setting was measured in the hundred low hundreds of millions. By the Civil War, the United States was producing 2 billion pounds of cotton per year all under this economic system. And this becomes, and I'm gonna end with this, um, this becomes in a way that has also been neglected, a principal aspect or element in, so I called the prison industrial labor complex, the most important economic innovation of the modern age after the, the industrial revolution. But this cotton boom eked out of Africans through that um, uh, labor complex is actually the supplier of the raw material that is the basis for the Industrial Revolution. In other words, we tell a story about the Industrial Revolution traditionally in most of our histor history books and, and, and in the way this is taught of English ingenuity, of organizing labor and of creating cotton um, looms to spin cotton and you know, gathering people together to work under one place, one roof, and the, the birth of the factory. And, and there was indeed in, 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 in ingenious sort of creation involved in such the elaboration or perfection of such processes. But in telling the story that way, we cut out of the picture the fact that the product, the, the commodity that these products derive from, cotton, we've cut it completely out of the picture. And, 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 and I don't have the decade by decade um, numbers right in front of me to recite to you, but the point I want to leave you with is the productivity of production or the, the quantity of production of cotton in the United States, where one out of uh, 13 people in the young United States was, and almost all of them Africans or descendants of Africans, were employed or were bound up in the production of cotton. This, the output of cotton increases necessarily in lockstep with the output of British textiles. And the reason they are in lockstep is because all of the British textiles are made from cotton produced in these slave industrial settings. So I think I will stop with my introductory remarks there. Adrian, I know that you wanted me to speak about the, uh, the, the, the moment, so to speak, where we are right now and into which my book was, was sort of born, if you will. And I, I'll just say very quickly that I began work on this book 10 years ago um, in terms of reading and research. And for a project like this, nobody can do it. It's, it's a fool's errand to try to anticipate what the, what the zeitgeist is going to be like or what the sort of conversation is going to be like when the book arrives at market. This is uh, an author of a book like this has enough to worry about without trying to predict where the political conversation is going to be. But having said that, this book did arrive in a very particular political moment in the United States. Um, and I watched it with a little bit of anxiety or trepidation as I was in the very final editing stages of the book. It was too late to sort of alter my, my account in any fundamental way, but 
but tremendous things were happening in, in the society from which I speak, your neighbor, the United States to the South, and more broadly in a number of Western countries where uh, the place of people of African descent in these societies was, be, was coming under uh, re-examination and where resistance to uh, present day oppression was uh, uh, um, being energized uh, uh, in, uh, in the first instance as a response to acts of police brutality as in um, uh, um, uh, the um, killing of a man named George Floyd uh, in the United States. Um, and this led to, uh, as most of you will probably know, to great acts of iconoclasm, meaning the smashing of monuments here and there uh, as people mulled over, ruminated about uh, how we are taught our history and what, how this has led to the celebration of false idols, people who were actually deeply involved with acts of evil uh, and uh, of moral horror in the past, who we have elevated uh, um, and who we had elevated in past eras to herodom and had never paused to re-examine as time went on until, until this, this moment, as you uh, have phrased it in our conversation, Adrian arrived. And so my book arrives in this moment um, and my book arrives with a particular hope uh, and that is not having planned to arrive in this moment that it can help in its own modest way, nudge our conversations further in a very particular direction. And the direction is that I have in mind here is that um, we need to understand, first of all, how, um, how integrated the history of the Atlantic world is. That thinking about our histories as nation states is a way of uh, blinding ourselves to the real nature of our history, uh, to the true texture of this history, and to the roles of truly important actors and of agents and of peoples that have been written out of accounts. And one of the best examples of that is what I said about Haitian history. The events that took place in Haiti in the, at the end of the um, 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century shaped the entire history of the Atlantic world. Um, uh, there's a very famous quote um, in my book from Voltaire. I don't know how familiar Canadians are with this, but Voltaire, um, the, the, the great French writer in the 18th century, had a great quip about, um, you know, it was a much better idea to sell off or to trade off the vast expanses of snow of Canada uh, back to the English in exchange for the tiny little sugar islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe. That is how uh, uh, of uh, how much world, significant, world historical significance was bound up in the processes that I've described to you. So the first hope that I have is of making people, whether they are Europeans, what, well, Western Europeans especially, or whether they are North Americans, or whether they are South Americans, or people of the Caribbean, or of West and Central Africa, or Africa more broadly, to understand how, in, how, how densely interwoven the history of the Atlantic world is. And then my final hope is that peoples of African descent in, the African de in Africa and of the African diaspora arrive through an appreciation of this interwoven history at a way of overcoming um, petty chauvinisms that I think have divided uh, the African di diaspora uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, to their harm. In other words, African Americans uh, have a great history and have much to be proud of and much to agonize over, but they don't spend enough time thinking about how their history is one with this much broader Atlantic history. I don't know Canadian historical debates well enough to make to pronounce myself in the, much the same way, but I suspect th that somebody who who observes such things could say something similar. Brazilians are caught up in their own uh, inwardly looking chauvinism and to the neglect of their incredible role in this broader history. People of the Caribbeans, much the same is true. And Africans of West and Central Africa, uh, regions of the world I have deep and long experience with, very often I've, I've had so many conversations where that's not that history of the people that were taken away, that's not really our history. That doesn't like, yeah, it's kind of a sad story, but it doesn't have anything to do with us. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. The situation that we find ourselves in, all of us, along this rim of the Atlantic Ocean is bound up in the circumstances of, uh, of, of, of this interwoven history. And so this book is written in that spirit of, uh, of helping bring us together around these common themes. Well, Howard, thank you so much for that very comprehensive and, and trenchant uh, intervention uh, for that presentation. I, I re really do appreciate it. And as I was listening to you, and as I was reading your book, I couldn't help but think about two figures. And I think you're kind of operating in a similar tradition to the likes of Carter G. Woodson, uh, who, like you, has Virginian roots. Mm -hmm. um, Carter G. Woodson, of course, it was a historian who uh, studied at Harvard University, received a PhD, I think and it was in 1912, of the son of enslaved peoples. Uh, he is the one who's credited with, with coming up with the idea of First Negro History Week that became a Black History Month. And he was committed to inserting, to, to ensuring that, that African people and, and Africa was, had its rightful place in history. He, 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 he was disturbed and, and offended and, 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 and incensed at, at the distortions that had, had existed uh, in, in the literature and in the discourse about Africa and about Africans. And so he was in many ways trying to rewrite uh, African Africans back into history, I think like you are trying to do. And I'm also thinking of, of, of Walter Rodney, uh, the, the Guyanese historian uh, who, you know, astonishingly, you know, at the age of 30 years old, born 1942, 1972, he publishes How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, a monumental piece of work that again, reimagines the relationship that Africa has with the modern world and with Europe. Um, I think you're operating in that tradition as well, because, you know, your book could be called, you know, How Africa Developed Europe, you know, How Africa Developed the, the, the Modern World. But but what I'm curious about, and, 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 and so I'm, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm unsure as to whether to lament your book, the fact that it exists, or, or to celebrate it, because it seems as if this, this kind of commitment to the erasure of African, the, the, the centrality of Africa, uh, to the story of the modern world, to the centrality of, of Africa and Africans in the story of, of North America, of Europe, it, it seems like there's, there's this persistent commitment to that erasure. And I'm wondering, where do you, where does that come from? Um, this is a great question, uh, Adrian. Uh, and, but before I answer it, I have to say something about uh, your prior remarks. And thank you for the, putting me in such great company with, with I, I would never have imagined, you know, offering such a thought myself of Walter Rodney. Um, uh, um, uh, but, um, you know, it's more your your alternative title for my book is great, but in a way, it's not good enough. Um, Africa. What my book is really about is how Africa. It's you know, Carter Woodson and all this, and uh, you know, wanting to demand Africans and Africa having a place, and people of African descent having a place, and that we take a pause for a moment to remember. There's a kind of um, uh, I think you used the word lament already, right? This sounds like a lament, right? It sounds like, and I know this was not Carter Woodson's spirit, right? But it almost comes across as we encounter this notion today as a kind of begging, as a kind of special pleading. Oh, please pay attention to Africans, okay? Or people of the African diaspora or Black Americans for a month will, and, and you know, people who are not of African extraction think, oh, we had to give this to them, right? Um, this is, this is basically for the purposes, it's a sop. It's for social peace, it's a small gesture. We had to give it to them, right? I'm gonna go a step further. Africa and Africans created the West. The West was created. It wasn't just that they were made rich. It was created by Africa and Africans. And what do I mean? But Howard, why are we still talking about that? No, it's 2022. Why, are we, why do we still have to have this conversation now? Like Carter G. Woodson was talking about this almost 100 years ago. Yes. You know, why, why, why are we so, why is your book as revelatory <laughs> as it seems to be in 2020? I'm going to answer that, but I have to, I have to finish this thought uh, with some data, which I didn't use a lot of data in my talk, right? Up until the year 1820, four times as many people were brought across the Atlantic from Africa than from Europe. 
wrap your minds around that. Up until the year 1820, and you can all go verify this, right? If you want to, don't want to buy the book, just look through the notes in the bookstore, okay? This is bulletproof. Up until the year 1820, four times as many people were brought across the Atlantic from Africa than from Europe. Who do you think built the West? Where does anybody get the idea that the West was built by Europeans? It's an amazing act of, of distortion or of delusion. The labor came, and it was not only raw labor, but clearly the labor came from people from Africa, right? Four times, four-fifths of the people who came to the New World came from Africa up until the year 1820, right? Um, and so when I say the West, it's important to pause to say, what is the West? The West is this intimate condominium that comes to exist at a moment in history against this backdrop of the the economic innovation of the prison industrial labor system that I spoke about. Of, so this integration economically and to some extent politically between Europe, Western Europe and the continental Americas. That's the West. That's even people who don't pause to think about what the West is today. They throw it around political conversation. That's really what they're talking about. They're talking about Western Europe and especially English speaking North America. That's the West. That's the essence of the West, right? Those things, or this thing, this condominium was created with the, um, uh, uh, um, the sort of enzyme, that, the enzyme that did the work was this four-fifths of the people who came across the Atlantic in those centuries, who, who made North America economically viable and prosperous. And by the way, for most of the history, North America was nowhere economically speaking. The Caribbean was the center of the action. Uh, the, the young United States and Canada, especially maritime Canada, their wherewithal was selling stuff, provisioning the Caribbean. All the economic activity was in the Caribbean. That's where U Europe's wealth was coming from. I've already given you the case of Haiti, you know, two thirds of France's external trade, all of that, et cetera, et cetera, right? So back to your question, why do we have to keep taught, relearning this lesson? Why do we have to have this conversation today? Why, do, how, could this, how could it be that this could still shock anybody or even come as a mild surprise these days? The reason, and why are African Africans diminished constantly? What, yeah. what, like, what, what explains that? So the reason, the answer to the questions is just, to those two questions is the same answer. So um, every society, every civilization, without exception in my experience, looks for virtues within itself, within its own stories to build myths about their destiny, how they became great. And they don't explain their greatness by how they exploited other people. They explain their greatness by sort of weaving narratives about their own inventiveness or their entrepreneurial spirit or their courage and bravery or their work ethic or their uh, religious ideals. This has happened time and time again in, in history. And so that's the, that's the one side of the coin in terms of the answer to your question. The other side of the, so that's just normal. So Westerners, industrialization is about ingenious people who got together in the Lancashire region of England and figured out how to organize labor and to put together loops, right? It cuts out where the stuff came from, but it leans on this pattern that I've described of every civilization finding the sources of its own genius and success within itself and not looking outwardly, right? But the reason why this is such an extreme example, the story of the West is such an extreme example in, uh, according to this pattern that I think is universal is because the horror that attaches to what was done with Africa and with Africans is so absolute then in order to preserve space, psychologically speaking, for this nice mythical story about how wonderful we as Westerners are and what a great thing, a unique thing our work ethic is and how our Judeo-Christian um, ethics are, are just totally unique and special in the world. If you have to keep in your mind room for the horror, you won't have room for that. The horror is so enormous. It is so monstrous in dimensions that it required of the peoples who founded these myths and who have made long careers across decades and centuries, weaving fantasies about these myths, building literature on the basis of these myths, 
making Hollywood on the basis of these myths, <clears throat> it requires the erasure because the dimension of the horror is that great. And so, you know, uh, it, it, it's not, it's the normal pattern isn't sufficient against the backdrop of that horror where we'll just tell a nice story about how our ancestors were, you know, courageous explorers or great adventurers or wonderful thinkers or religious philosophers or things like that. That doesn't help you get rid of the, the bad side of the story. And the bad side of the story is so immense that it takes active suppression. And that's why this thing has to be rediscovered over and over again. And why a book like mine can come out and surprise readers who are encountering this for the first time, because the, this is unpleasant. And it's, un, and it's challenging to the sanctity, to the kind of psychological wholeness. It's difficult to, to take on myth. It's, it's it, it, you know, I, I spent almost no energy in my book. And I think people who heard me talk did not hear me trying to, you know, make any effort to make people feel guilty. I don't think my audience needs to feel guilty. I'm not trying to wag my finger at any individual who may be listening to me tonight or maybe reading my book, but there's a vulnerability uh, about the negative dimensions of this story that is such that it requires active suppression. And so it is that active suppression that a kind of vigilance, a policing of the story for the psychic protection of the people who have embraced this myth that causes us to continually rediscover aspects of this history. And yet you do have critics. <clears throat> Howard French, you know, that you do have you do have some people who will push back on you and who will say, I think there was a review in Publishers Weekly uh, that, that suggested that you're kind of you're kind of torquing things. You're exaggerating the centrality of slavery. They, they, they make the argument that once slavery ended, Europe and, and, and North America flourished. You know, they, they, it, it continued. It continued to develop in spite of not having that that kind of slave technology in its sure. grasp. So how do you how do you respond how do you respond to that argument? Well, first of all, I mean, I just have to say that it's normal to have critics, right? So I'm not offended by that. I didn't think that that this particular piece of criticism was very interesting, but but yeah, it's, I expect it. In fact, I welcome. It's great to have, to the extent that my book or books like this suscitate debate and discussion, they are succeeding because that's the point: getting people to engage with the ideas. That critic didn't engage with the ideas at all. He just basically said, Howard French is going too far. I think he actually used the phrase too far. Yeah, exaggerating. <laughs> yes. And in doing so, he's trying to dismiss me with a wave of the hand, right? Without engaging with the argument. To that kind of argument, I say, how long ago was slavery? Was slavery a long time ago? You know, um, I make the argument that the great divergence between Europe or the West more properly and the other great civilizational uh, areas that have dominated world history in terms of wealth and power throughout most of recorded time happens precisely at the moment or in the era of enslavement, of this innovation of the slave industrial, uh, the prison industrial labor camp that I've described, my own sort of proprietary term for this thing. It happens then. This is when the West is created and when the West diverges from other parts of the world. Now, having diverged with momentum, the momentum of this innovation of, the, of these institutions and the expropriation in my book appears, and I can't recite the number for you, but a, a, his, a British historian has actually estimated the number of, excuse me for the gendered nation, nature, uh, nature of this expression, but the number of man hours stolen from enslaved peoples in, the, in this, economic institution of the of the slave labor camp right in the billions of of stolen hours of labor this created a momentum for the west and one would not expect that okay so the moment that slavery ends in the west then you know the engine goes into reverse or that you know there's no there's no continual ascent right um it's a very simplistic question but let me add one more layer to the answer and that is you know, in many of my talks, especially when there are British academics or me Brit members of the British public in the audience, <clears throat> we reach a point where I am forced to confront a very common, the most prevalent, in fact, British notion of the slave age. The British conventional notion of the slave age is that the history of slavery begins when 
Britain decided to abolish slavery. But that's the point at which it becomes interesting to talk about slavery and to give any note to the discussion of the importance of, of Atlantic slavery to world history, that we, the British, stopped the slave trade, and therefore aren't we great. I, you know, don't believe me, folks, who, those of you who think I exaggerate, do a little research into the way this era is taught in Britain, and you will find, I am confident, this is the conventional way, right? Uh, it cuts out the fact that for the previous 125 or so years, Britain had been the leading slave trader in the world to such an extent that it was shipping more slaves than all of the other European countries combined. Okay, so the British history doesn't deal with that. The, te the conventional tellings and teaching of British history doesn't deal with that at all. It starts with, at a certain point in the early 1800s, we established uh, maritime patrols off the coast of West Africa to interdict slave ships. And we, the English, decided to stop this brutal practice, right? So it's cut off the, 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 the precedent or the pretext, the, the, pr the prior history of leading the slave trade, meaning more slaves traded by Britain than all the rest of Europe combined. It cuts that out of the picture, but it also cuts something else out of the picture, which is significant to the question that, that, that you've just relayed from indirectly via Publishers Weekly. And that is that not long after abolishing enslavement, Britain then institutes forced labor in its new colonies in Africa. I'm sure most of your listeners don't have don't know that. Uh, something else to look up. Forced labor. How far is forced labor from slavery? In other words, forcing colonized Africans to work mostly in agricultural production, sometimes for the purpose of laying railroad tracks or other uh, hard labor tasks like that in Britain's colonies in Africa. And Britain was not alone. France did this, Portugal did this, Spain did this, uh, and others did this in, in uh, Africa in this imperial age. So slavery has ended under the name of, sl of slavery, but something quite akin to slavery is reinstituted almost immediately in an African environment. And guess when that ended? That ended only after the Second World War. So the person who says, yeah, but why is the West like this? You know, slavery ended a long time ago. This is the question of, excuse me, no, I'm sure you know this, not directed at you, Adrian. This is, these kinds of questions are the questions either of ignoramuses, people who don't know anything about history, or people who are of bad faith, who don't want to know anything about it. actively. This is the erasure part the people who actively don't want to know anything about history because their psyche is too delicate. It, there's too much at stake. It will destroy their worldview or provide term, provoke turmoil in their sense of self. You know, Howard, I, I do want to get to the questions from the audience, but I, I do have one question that I want to ask before that. And, and mm -hmm. you, you talked about Hegel and, and you talked about instances in um, history, like a lot of the, the political theorists and, and historians who, who talked about who, who, who talked about Africa and Africans somehow existing outside of history. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really think your book is as much about the present <laughs> as it is about the past, because I think the kind of modern day manifestation of what Hegel was talking about is, is the sense that, that Africa is not an ongoing concern. That, that, and, and we see that in the way, in the journalism, in, in the way in which journalism uh, is practiced when it comes to uh, Africa and Africans. The, the Western media treats, uh, you know, Africa and Africans as pestilence, as as pathology. Uh, we only hear about stories, where we often hear about stories in in Africa when there is disaster or when there is disruption. Uh, that's that's the only time when we talk about about politics, but we don't talk about the kind of everyday politics like we do for example in england where we hear about how boris johnson has funny hair or right. you know whatever the case might be or or right. liz, liz trust is, is up to you know the foreign secretary is up to such and such can you kind of explain that like explain the kind of relationship between um your argument in your book right and the way in which journalism um man, uh, uh, is practiced you know in this contemporary moment well, I think you can draw a line 
uh, directly from uh, the traditions of um, historiography uh, of the emergence of the modern world in which Africa is talked about as a geographic obstacle that needs to be um, uh, circumnavigated and thereby overcome a place that is historically inert that has no uh, inherent interest of any kind uh, which is quite literally the way Africa is traditionally has traditionally been written about in, in this age right the overwhelming bulk of world histories of this age of the emergence of modern modernity and of the modern world treat Africa this way I have surveyed the literature it's overwhelming right you can draw a straight line from that to the kind of journalism that you just described in which Africa is not well, it is circumnavigated to some extent, meaning that we, um, it, we meaning the Western media, invest far fewer resources in covering Africa if you measure it by demographics or by geographic extent or any other sort of obvious way of any kind of metric, rational metric you could come across with, where you know far smaller parts of the world receive. Uh, um, um, uh, a, on a per capita or on a geographic basis, vastly more coverage than than almost any African country or even than the African continent as a whole does. But then there's something more to it, more sort of um, insidious uh, uh, and complicated uh, to the the degree of willful disregard for Africa in our journalism that, that I have noted that I fought against in my own career and which you have just observed and expressed via your question. And that is, it gets back to what you said about Boris Johnson. We don't create, we don't treat African countries as true societies. What do true societies have? True societies have politics, they have culture, they have business, they have economies, they have innovators, they have heroes, they have villains, they have achievers, they have ordinary people who are struggling with ordinary problems. That's how you cover a society. Those are the elements that we think of in normal, it, normally in journalism as being social elements. When Western journalists go to Africa to cover Africa, almost all of that stuff is cut out. Uh, Africa is reduced in the ways you suggested in your question to problems of a kind of meta nature where we're not really, nobody has time to um, think about what's happening in Zambia or like who's who in Zambia or what are the social forces in Zambia just to pick a country randomly, right? Um, or, or, or Burkina Faso or Malawi or Gambia or what have you, right? And so um, there's only two ways under current convention to write about Africa. And that is to use a, ran a nearly randomly chosen African place to write some broadly stereotypical characterization about Africa to say that the journalist, is, the journalist may find herself in Zambia or in Gambia, but she's writing about a phenomenon that is all over Africa. Look how frequently you'll see this expression across Africa. Uh, it happens with an alarming frequency and in a way that you don't see other continents ever written about. How many stories do you see written about across Asia or across Latin America? I'm not saying there's never a circumstance where a phrase like that is legitimate, but this is a standard treatment for African coverage. And it is atypical for coverage of every other continent, that every story. So the two conventions in Africa is something has to be absolutely horrible, like a uh, in a way that threatens Westerners in their homes, like Ebola, for example, becomes like this um, phantasm that it's gonna, you know, this, this pathogen's gonna escape Africa. And next thing you know, Africa is gonna destroy our comfort and, 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 and well being in Canada or in Australia or in France or wherever, right? Or else, if when events don't, arrive, don't rise to that sort of level of notoriety, where news editors decide it's worth paying attention to something in Africa. In the other instance, it's the broad generalization, the sort of macro look at Africa, the lazy picking of an example in one place and then describing it almost apologetically to the reader. Dear reader, we're sorry we have to bore you with things that are taking place in Africa. We know you're not inherently interested in Africa, but to try to make this 
a little bit more worth your time. We'll pretend that this isn't just about one country. This is about Africa in general, even though I'm in one country right now and haven't talked to Africans in any other country. So the, these are the two standard tropes that you see that reduce Africa to abstractions and mini minimalize or trivialize life in Africa. Let me just say, I know this has been a long answer, um, but Africa is this old saw that says, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. I'm gonna give you a, a twist on that saw and say to your readers, you may not be inter interested in Africa, but Africa is interested in you. Uh, and what do I mean by this? What I mean is that Africa is today 1.4 billion people. By the middle of this century, it's going to be 2.5 billion people. By the end of this century, it is almost certainly going to be above 3 billion people and, and perhaps beyond 4 and approaching 5 billion people. That means almost all of the incremental growth in the human population is taking place right now in Africa. This is where the young people of the world are and will be coming from for the following decades. You may think Africa has nothing to do with you, but I can assure you, Africa is going to have a lot to do with you, right? Africa is coming. Uh, and I don't say this as a threat or something. I'm not trying to sort of pathologize Africa and to say, oh, no, the worst thing that could happen is that Africans could spread out over the world. But the fact is, Africans are right now changing the world in ways that our mental habits about Africa don't allow us to perceive. And this is principally an effect of the kind of blinders that the, that the media have toward Africa, which you asked me about. Mm -hmm. I want to get to the questions. I don't want to dominate <laughs> the session. Um, sure. Andy Davis has a question. And the question is, in the early days of the prison labor complex, were there organized resistance abolitionist movements in Europe and in Africa? Absolutely. Um, so uh, thank you for that question. Um, I don't want to sound like an advertisement for my book, but organized resistance begins right from the very start of this story. And my book has a very um, detailed account of, so Sao Tome, this place that many of your, uh, many in the audience may never have thought about, even if you've heard the name before, even once, pause to think about it. Sao Tome, like what does Sao Tome have to do with me, right? Sao Tome is the place where this complex is born. And as this complex is born and perfected, as it happened in this setting of Sao Tome, so is resistance born. In Sao Tome, there's this incredibly dramatic uh, slave uprising, which is born from a, a ship revolt as I told you that as the Portuguese had the idea of growing sugar on this island, they're experimenting with sugar, they need labor, they're trying to bring enslaved, newly enslaved peoples from nearby continental Africa to the island. On one of these ships, just shy of the shore of Sao Tome, the enslaved peoples rose up in rebellion and they overthrew the masters of the ship. They didn't know how to sail the ship. The ship ship shipwrecked into onto rocks that large rocks off the coast of Sao Tome, and somehow the African a significant number of the Africans managed to swim to shore, and they set themselves up in a community in the dense forest in the southern part of this island, beyond the reach of the European settlement, and lived for decades without the Europeans even knowing that they were there or having much of an idea about the nature of their community. The Europeans were unable to penetrate the forest. The first big slave revolt in history arises from this. First of all, there's the shipboard thing, which is a relatively minor thing. But the slave, the, the, these maroon, so-called maroon communities of people who had risen up in revolt on the ship and established themselves in the forest, they, they create lines of communication with enslaved peoples on quote unquote plantations operated by the Portuguese in the other parts of Sao Tome. And they plot, they conspire to rise up. And this rebellion, which is described in detail in my book, comes within a hair's breadth of succeeding, of overthrowing Portuguese rule. So right from the very start of the creation of this complex, even prior to the transatlantic slave trade itself, we see major efforts, and these are one after another. I wanted to say culminating. It doesn't culminate in, his, in Haiti um, because uh, the American Civil War comes after the Haitian Revolution, right? So, but so one after another, 
uh, there are instances of dramatic, uh, uh, heroic resistance and rebellion by enslaved people everywhere this institution spreads to. Next question. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what was the role of native Africans in the transatlantic industrial complex and were Africans culpable in the plunder? Uh, very good question. Uh, a question I get asked a lot. I don't know the person who asked me this question. and I don't want to um, cast any aspersions on the intentions of the person who's asking this question. It's a good question. However, I get asked this question sometimes by people whose intentions seem less than positive to me. Uh, and uh, actually, sometimes this has been put to me bluntly in a way uh, like what follows. And that is, why should Europeans, or why should some, in some instances, the question has been put to me, why should white people feel guilty about slavery if Africans themselves were selling slaves to, to the Europeans? Uh, first of all, as I said earlier in my remarks, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I'm trying to say, let's think more carefully and more realistically, more honestly about history. And out of that search for honesty and care for details, we will arrive at a better place, all of us, right? So this isn't about guilt. So the second thing I want to say in answer to this question is <clears throat> that Africans indeed sold people into slavery across the Atlantic to Europeans. It's worth pausing to understand some of the mechanisms or the, the sort of social basis for this phenomenon, right? Africans prior to coloniz colonization had no idea of themselves like we have of them as Africans. There was no such thing as Africa to Africans. In a world where everyone is African, African is the, is the baseline, it's the standard. There's no notion that the people 100 miles down the coast or 100 miles inland share some common thing called Africanness to you. African is universal. Everybody's African except the strangers who keep showing up with their ships wanting to buy people, right? So there's no notion, there was no reason for Africans to come together in this era to say, hey, uh, we have to stand together as Africans against this thing called the transatlantic slave trade. The next step in the response to this, though, is a little more complicated, and it involves understanding why chattel slavery was of such world historical, was such a world historical departure. So there had never been anything like such a systematic enslavement of people on the basis of race and transgenerationally as chattel slavery for the purposes of grinding them to death in prison industrial labor settings. That had never happened before in world history. Slavery has a very old history. So the oldest economic, so there's this saying, uh, which, you know, um, anyway, I'm not gonna say it's somewhat politically incorrect. Um, but slavery has been with us since the beginning of time. Slavery has existed in every region of the world, in every civilization up until the, the very recent past. And some would say it's still with us, right? What's different about slavery? So the, the English person or the French person or the Portuguese or the Spanish who shows up in an African milieu wanting to buy human beings for the purposes of slavery, how did the African process this? If having no idea about uh, some synthetic identity called African, which is familiar to us today, but which would have been utterly alien to them at this time, what were they to make of it? Africans had enslavement in their own societies in this time. And this, their patterns of enslavement were far more common to, in terms of world history than chattel slavery, which as I've said, was utterly new and unique. In African slavery, the purpose of enslavement was the enlargement of the society. In other words, two neighboring or nearby groups have a war and the victorious side seizes members of the losing side and incorporates them into their society relatively quickly. There's no such thing as transgenerational enslavement in the African milieu. You can't find it in the record. The, sometimes the women are married off very quickly. Sometimes the men are uh, put to work in agricultural or menial, menial tasks um, uh, as a result of their enslavement, but in no case does the enslavement trans, uh, uh, cross generations as it does under chattel slavery. 
And there's a reason for that. In this setting, in this political socioeconomic setting, meaning in the African continent in this period, the wealth of a leader was measured in large part by the size of his population, by the size of his people, right? And so assimilation was the priority. And so the Europeans, and this is attested to, by the way, I should say in a quick aside, by the fact that most of the major kingdoms in African history that we have detailed records about have multiple instances of rulers whose mothers or grandparents were slaves. So this is utterly different from chattel slavery in this new institutional form that I've described for you, it's completely different. And so when the European shows up, say on a ship, saying in Angola or in Ghana or in Senegal or wherever, I wanna buy human beings from you, the African doesn't find it unusual, the idea of what someone wanting to buy a human being. Africans are trying to acquire human beings along the lines that I've just spoken to. Um, but the Africans have no sense, they have no conception. They've never seen or heard or even imagined of an institution like chattel, whereby, that, first of all, they don't know that these people are being sent to the new world. They don't get a chance to go to the new world. They don't inspect the premises and say, oh, this is, let me, you wanna buy people from us? Let's go see if you meet the sort of FDA inspection uh, regimen for, for plantations, right? They don't get to the new world to see the purposes to which these people were being put. And they have no conception of this. This is actually part of what delays this for synthetic formation of an African identity. Africans have no sense that Europeans have reduced them to a category called Africans and that Africans in the minds of Europeans equals simply, directly equals slave, right? They just know that we like to buy human beings for the enlargement of our societies because that's how we measure traditionally wealth and power. And so here are the Europeans who want to buy people presumably for the same purposes. Uh, and so this is the social and political basis upon which in the, the, the transaction takes place between Africans and Europeans in the slave trade. I don't say this because I would have liked to be a slave in an African society. I, don't, I wouldn't want to be a slave in any, in any social or political setting, but the conditions and the arrangements, socially speaking, were totally different. Sorry about that. This That's is from okay. Coretta. This I, is from, I thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Coretta Williams. She, uh, she says, uh, may I ask why you choose to use the word discovered in referring to the Portuguese's landing in Brazil? Oh, because I believe it was a discovery for them. The dis there was a discovery of a continent that they didn't know existed. And it's in that narrow sense that I mean discovered. I don't mean to suggest in any way. And in fact, in other usages, I made of the word discovered, for example, with Christopher Columbus, I said in quotations or quote unquote, I, 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 I did that specifically. I was, I was speaking narrowly to the, to the reason why the, the, the Portuguese at a certain moment in time learned of the existence of a continent called mm -hmm. South America, that this was a discovery to them and it was not something they were looking for. It was they were trying to get down the coast, find out the fastest ways to keep going down the coast of Africa by tacking, by operating at sea, these triangular movements, right? Sailing west and then cutting east. And as they made longer and longer legs of these triangles, eventually they run into the Brazilian coast. And so it's only in that sense, uh, believe me, uh, not for political reasons, I'm speaking of a discovery. Mm -hmm. One other quick question that I do want to just pivot, but mm -hmm. I did, I did be having Bayesian roots like I do, uh, mm -hmm. Barbadian roots, you said something that, that I, I wasn't quite sure about. And I think you said that Barbados in the early 1600s was uninhabited. Yes, it had, you, been, it had been inhabited that, previously. But use that term because there, there were, of course, Tainos. There were, of course, indigenous peoples. Not in 1630. In, in, in Barbados. No. So there had, I'm pretty confident of this, that at the time of the English arrival, there were no inhabitants of the island of Barbados. There had, the, the um, Arawak population had been wiped out uh, in uh, the pr prior century by Taino raiding. Uh, and the island had gone uninhabited for some time. Uh, there was clear evidence of human inhabitation on the island. And in fact, I've been to the National Museum in Barbados and you can see the relics of this inhabitation. 
but at the moment of English arrival, I'm pretty confident that there there were no settlements of native populations on the island. Okay, Howard, this is a huge. This was a huge undertaking on your part. Six hundred years of history. That that's that, that the, the scope of of this of this uh, of this book of yours is is kind of overwhelming. Uh, I think you have something like fifty pages of footnotes, right? Fifty pages. This is a well documented book. Um, you're not a you're not a quote unquote trained historian. Uh, you're a journalist, but but this is a history book. But I will say that it doesn't read like your kind of conventional history book, uh, which which unfortunately maybe has a tendency to be a little bit ponderous and a little bit turgid at time at times. Uh, you know, you write like a journalist, and 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 the 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 the, the, the words flow. Um, but I'm just curious, and 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 this question was was asked by by Hermona. Uh, Clubberhan as well, like just how you went about approaching this book, like from, from, from a writing standpoint, how did you even kind of wrap your head around writing this text, <laughs> this extended text of yours, and, and, and what were you trying to, I suppose, convey to the reader? How, what, how did you want the reader to kind of feel in reading your book? Um, uh, thank you, Hermona. Um, I, you know, I, um, First of all, I, I've, I sort of grew into this new vocation, if you will, of writing history. Uh, if you, if for anyone who knows any of my previous books, I've sort of, I had been inching in this direction bit by bit from one book to the next. And my last book prior to this book was really pretty frankly a work of history of East Asia, um, looking at how over, uh, different eras, China has conceived of itself as a world power and what power has meant, globally speaking, within Chinese civilization. And I, I, I had to overcome my trepidation on taking on a frankly historical topic like this in order to carry out that, uh, the, right, the work on that book. Um, and I had to um, engage with lots of obviously lots of literature, but also I, I talked with lots of historians, active acad academic historians, to sort of test out ideas uh, on them and to seek suggestions of places to look for deeper or different accounts of things I was interested in. So that book was really kind of the, the training ground for this book. Uh, and in fact, it was something more. It was in the research on that book that I came across for the first time in my life as what as I think as of myself as a, a, a very active reader and a curiously minded person who was widely traveled in the world, right? I come across in the research for that book for the first time ever of accounts of Portuguese navigators in the 15th century who instead of racing off to Asia, as we are usually told, in fact, dwelled in Africa for two decades. That's where I learned this. I'm learned, trying to figure out what the first European Chinese encounters were. And accidentally I come across this, uh, this discovery of mine that the Portuguese had spent two plus decades in the, exclusively working in an African environment right before the more famous discoveries that we usually in standard accounts ascribe to the sort of uh, beginnings of the modern world. And so this, this book actually comes directly out of the experience of that book in these two ways. Um, in terms of what I wanted, how I decided, or how I sort of planned the writing of the book, I mean, I knew that I needed to, that this 600 years, as you've said, is, can, should, can, because all of this is so neglected and so suppressed and effaced, and because we, even well-educated people, are so uninformed about such large chunks of this history. And because this history, as I said a few minutes ago in talking about the Atlantic world, is so tightly interwoven and interlocked, I knew from the beginning that I needed to tell a, a, a broad tapestry, broad in terms of spanning centuries, and that led to the 16th. I knew it didn't make sense to just tell a history of the 19th century or of the beginnings of the slave trade or the start of the exploration that we that we speak about as having launched the modern world but this all belonged in one book together and i knew that i needed so i decided at an early stage that i needed to cover 
this time span and this geography. And I also had was inspired by terror. Like I'm going to take on um, a tapestry this big involving topics that academic historians spend their entire lives confining themselves to much smaller tranches of this. So, you know, some careers, the entire career of a scholar uh, could be 30 years of this history or 50 years of this history, right? That's not uncommon. And so I was inspired by terror. Like I didn't write this book for them, but I want this book to be well received in their communities too. I want this book to withhold critical conversation among scholars too. It doesn't mean I shouldn't be prepared for somebody to contradict me or even to say that I'm wrong on this for that point. But I want the book to sort of hold its, it, you know, to, to hold up to criticism and to be respected by people who do, you know, have made careers doing serious work in the many different topical areas. And so this made me, on the one hand, become a complete rat of the archives um, to sort of dwell in the library. And you've said that I have 50 pages of endnotes, which is true. Uh, I, you know, many other things that I read don't get mentioned in the endnotes. Uh, I wanted to do a bibliography in the book. The publishers didn't want it. They said, I'll scare people away. The bibliography will be another 50 pages. And people don't like to read big fat books, right? In general, that's the sort of market preference, right? Um, so the other tension against the tension of wanting to write something that would hold uh, or withstand scrutiny by academic historians and not, you know, uh, uh, cause me any sort of embarrassment uh, was wanting people to ordinary people, so to speak, want to read the book and want to pers want to wish to persist through the five hundred some pages of the book, and this was another kind of terror. Uh, where wanting to be inclusive and to be accurate and to be fully documented on the one hand and trying constantly to find ways to tell the story and to keep the narrative propelled sufficiently so that the untrained historian, the unacademically oriented reader, uh, who, who, by the way, coming from journalism, whom I respect tremendously, right? That that kind of person will not feel Look, some people are going to be scared away by the size of the book to begin with. I don't have time for a book that big. I can't do anything about that. But I had in mind the person who buys the book and starts to read it. I want them to finish the book, right? And so this inspired a lot of my writing choices and some of my compromise. I ended up leaving out lots of things, lots of details, lots of potential footnotes. As I said, uh, the bibliography, um, uh, many other arguments, you name any period in the narration of these 600 years, and I could tell you right off the top of my head stuff that I left out of the book. And so so, so I had to do a lot. Of, it's not obvious to the casual consumer, but I had to do a lot of subtraction to get to this point also. And it was in the purpose of keeping the reader engaged. And I also had to inject finally, I should say, um, uh, and I, I kept this to a fairly um, small minimum, but at opportune moments in the book, I had to inject a little bit of personal stuff in the book. And that could be mean me making a personal observation, actually not just writing about places, but visiting the places themselves and trying to sort of uh, vivify them on the page for the reader, a technique I learned from journalism, or finally toward the very end of the book, talking about also, at the beginning of the book, talking about my wife's family, but at the very end of the book, talking about my family, bringing personal history into the book. Uh, all, of, all of these things were meant to kind of bring the reader into the embrace of the book and make them want to, to finish it. Much of our conversation tonight has been about this history book that you have written, but I, but I would be remiss if I did not address or at least talk a little bit about your own personal history. And also, this is a journalism event as well. And to talk about journalism, um, and we were talking, we were having this conversation the, the other night. Uh, you're a bit of a unicorn, and, and, and I mean that in, in, in the best sense. Uh, you've had an extraordinary career by any measure. You were the bureau chief uh, in West and Central Africa, in, in Central America and the Caribbean. You were a bureau chief in China. You were a bureau chief in, in Japan. Very few people have the kind of range of experiences that you had over the course of your career. You became a journalist, or at least you started working at the New York Times in 1986. You know, Ronald Reagan was still the president of the United States 
in, in 1986. There was no internet. And, and there weren't a lot of people like you in that position. And when I say people like you, I mean being a black journalist at the New York Times in 1986 sure. was not common. So the first question is, what was it like to be a black journalist at the New York Times, the, this elite institution in 1986? And then I have a question about being a foreign correspondent. Well, it was, a, it was you know, I don't want to play up my own struggles, right? But it was a difficult environment. It was a hostile environment. It was an environment where Black ambition was not celebrated or even welcome by one's peers, where uh, any time um, any opportunity was um, uh, 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 one for oneself, this was written off by one's peers as something given to you that, that, that you know, you were given an opportunity because you were black, that you, you know, sometimes quite explicitly because of affirmative action, that, you know, something had been handed to you, um, uh, which is ironic because, um, uh, uh, well, you know, the audience will just have to take me at my word for this, but I've had to work and work very hard for everything that I've done in this business uh, and in, in my career. And nothing was handed to me. You know, I learned a fluency in every language, uh, national language, everywhere I've worked. Uh, and without enumerating them, uh, you can just, uh, um, you know, review in your minds uh, the sort of curses that you described earlier, Adrian. Well, you speak Japanese, you. you speak Japanese, you speak Mandarin, you speak French, you speak Spanish, you speak yes. English. Yeah. 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 So I'm fluent. I Those are the ones I... I claim fluency in, and I speak others that I'm, I'm pretty good at, um, which I don't usually put in lists like this. And that's just really a, that's just a token of the sort of bigger effort that I'm speaking of. Uh, you know, um, I after people of black um, uh, um, descent in this moment that you're asking me about in this social and uh, national environment of the United States, the Reagan era, the pre-internet era, which you made me cringe as I heard that, like it really dated me. It's okay, I'm an old guy, right? But it really did make me feel it, right? Um, this was a really different time. And I don't mean to say that now is easy, right? But uh, there was much less space for discussion of things of all kinds that challenge you know, conventional wisdom and established narratives. Um, and black people, were not welcome in journalism at an elite level in general. And within the elite level, to the extent that they were, the door was open to them, they were channeled into, into sort of predefined areas. You know, that you were expect you were hired to cover the black beat, so to speak. And that was true whether you were a city reporter or a national reporter or an international reporter. And I arrived at the New York Times already having worked in Africa as a freelancer and speaking uh, uh, loudly about my ambitions, I already spoke different languages. I already had, was fluent in French and could diff, get around in Spanish. And I said, I want to cover the world for the New York Times. I've seen a fair amount of the world already. I'm a young guy. I want to cover the world. This wasn't something that Black people were supposed to want to do or that the New York Times was used to allowing Black people to do. And this caused great resentment and tension among some of my peers. Um, uh, which I've spoken to, uh, and even though, um, even in the face of my early successes in one place or another, the the entry into the next sort of position was always very grudging. So I, I, I've, as I told you on the telephone a couple of days ago, Adrian, I had come from Africa. I wanted to go other places in the world as a young correspondent, and the only thing they could think of was sending black people to Africa, and I don't clearly have anything against Africa. I've spent the last two hours talking to you guys about how important Africa is to the world and to me, right? Um, but I wanted to do other things also. Um, and so we butted heads for a long time. And the next, so when they finally gave me a chance, instead of sending me to Africa, they sent me to the Caribbean, which is kind of, even to this moment, a kind of bittersweet joke when I think about it, right? So they found the, 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 the largeness of spirit not to send me to Africa, which is the only place they had previously thought of sending any Black correspondent. I was the fourth one in the history of the New York Times, uh, but they sent me to the Caribbean. So um, uh, 
And then from the Caribbean, they sent me to Africa, back to Africa, which is also a, a wry expression, back to Africa. They sent me back to Africa. Um, and it was after that second stint in Africa, only after that second stint in Africa, that other opportunities arose for me. I was nominated for a bunch of prizes covering a war in Central Africa, the fall of the Mobutu dictatorship, a story that involved lots of personal duress and danger. I did well in that story. And the editor asked me in a surprise conversation that I don't think he had thought through, in fact, uh, late in my stay in Central Africa, where would I like to go next? And I think no sooner had the words escaped his lips that he realized that he had set himself up. And I said, I, had, I didn't know he was going to ask me this, but the way the Times works, uh, uh, any correspondent sort of ha should have a a general sense of the bureaus that are likely to be coming open in the relatively near future. And so I knew what they were. They were going to be Brazil, they were going to be South Africa, they were going to be Eastern Europe, and they were going to be Japan, right? And I had worked in Latin America, so I didn't want to go back to Brazil. Nothing wrong with Brazil, but I wanted to do new things. I had worked in Africa twice already, so I didn't want to go back to Africa. Um, uh, I didn't want to cover Eastern Europe where a war was breaking out in Kosovo at the time. I had covered plenty of wars and I blurted out Japan. And he said, Japan, like you could hear the shock in his voice. And, and uh, I don't want to ascribe too much. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to pretend to be able to read his mind too much, but I do know that he was surprised that I said that. And he challenged me, how could you do Japan? Like you've never been. And I said, what do you mean? How could I do Japan? You know, I've been doing all these other plays. What, what is it about Japan that I can't do? And he says, well, have you, do you, you know, he, he, wants, uh, he wanted to ask me, he's looking for a trick question that could help him to rule out Japan. And finally he settles on, but you don't speak the language. And I said, yes, but I speak other languages and I've proven my ability to learn language. So give me a chance to study Japanese. And on the basis of that conversation, I won an assignment to Japan and they gave me incredibly, um, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for this. It changed my life in many ways, including leading me, as I told you, via my last book to this book. They gave me a year to study Japanese and I became fluent in Japanese. Um, it didn't happen in one year, but on the basis of that kind of investment. Yeah, because I, I, was, I was telling you that the other night I was watching Clive Myrie, the, the very fine foreign correspondent for the BBC. Mm -hmm. and he was reporting from Kiev. Uh, where we know, of course, that the, that the invasion is currently taking place. It, it's, it's raging. Um, and, you know, he's, you know, Clive Myrie is a black man. And mm -hmm. it, I remember I was watching, I was thinking, this is unusual. Like, like it, it seemed, it just seemed, uh, I, I was surprised. <laughs> yeah. I, somehow I was surprised to see a black person, a black journalist for the BBC reporting from you know a white european country like the like ukraine um and you know we have for example two correspondents now uh, two african canadian correspondents for the cbc and radio canada in washington so mm -hmm. I, i'm i'm aware that it can happen but i was still somewhat surprised sure yeah and i'm not surprised that you were surprised because i get that same jolt every time I see something like this. And that's because even though it's much more common than it was in the era when I started in the mid eighties for, for the New York Times, it's still not anywhere near, um, these opportunities are not anywhere near available to people as col of color and not just black people, but especially black people perhaps as they should be. Uh, and this is true throughout the industry. Yeah. What, what do you make of the way in which this story of the invasion of Ukraine is being told. What, what are some things? I, I've been watching you on Twitter, and 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 some things have ki kind of gotten your goat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you've been a bit perturbed, a, a bit a bit ornery, a, a little bit crusty with, with some things that you've been seeing. So, what have you been seeing that you find problematic in the way in which the story is being covered? Well, so there's, you know, anybody who's been following this in so, on social media or even on regular television, I think has, would have a hard time uh, um, avoiding a, 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 a strong uh, 
a peculiar and strong inference. And sometimes it goes beyond an inference and becomes an explicit statement. And what I'm talking about is this notion, which I ha had been coming across for several days by the time I uh, sort of uh, uh, provided my crusty response on Twitter, that a brutal war, a war involving barbarity, I think this word was actually used in some, on some occasions, in Europe is an anomaly. Uh, and in some of the expressions of this, I even saw people respond to, uh, with surprise to the fact that something so barbarous could take place in the heart of Europe or of civilized Europe. And so- yeah, I, th I think this one of the statements was, this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. Yes, right. This kind of language is thrown around very casually in American political debates, anytime something, you know, talk about airports in the United States or the failings of the public health system or this or that, right? Anything negative is quickly associated with the third world in a way that is frankly um, insulting uh, to the third world, which is of course not a thing, right? The third world, what they're referring to when they say the third world is a vast universe and a highly diverse universe of states that have lots of different characteristics and are not uniform in any way. Uh, and in many cases have um, qualities that far surpass the depiction that's being um, attached to them, right? Through this slur, right? But, but there's this ahistoricity, this ahistorical notion that barbarity doesn't, it can't be associated with Europe is, is related to the question you asked me earlier about why do we have to keep learning this history, the history that I'm writing about? It's because the, there's the, 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 the persistence of the erasure and the effacement and the trivialization of Africa is attached at the hip to this notion of Europe as being a place of, uh, of um, uh, uniquely ennobled history and of humanity, humanity by implication on a higher order from humanity in other places. And so, and both of these things, describing Africa as a place of emptiness or of irrelevance or of lack of achievement or, or complete uninvolvement with history um, requires, um, they, they require a similar effort, right? Of, of, of uh, enforced, or self-enforced ignorance, right? Um, the, the Holocaust was not long ago. There are survivors of the Holocaust still amongst us, right? Stalin's behavior is not long ago, right? Killing people by the millions, his own people by the millions, never mind other people's, right? Um, Tre uh, Trebrenica. Trebrenica. The, the war that I Warm got- Crimea in 2014. The, the, it's 2014. But the, so the war that I nearly, that the four places I thought about when I was asked, where do you want to go? And I said, I don't want to go to Eastern Europe because precisely the Kosovo war was starting that. The war in Yugoslavia was as uncivil, if war can be spoken of as uncivilized, and I question that, uh, it was as uncivilized a war as we have seen, right? Uh, as brutal and inhumane and barbarous a war as any war. But nonetheless, it's just like, why do we have to keep learning that Africa actually was part of history? We have to keep relearning that actually Europe was in fact also the site of great horror, horror between Europeans and horror perpetrated on others by Europeans. And these are the two, si these are two sides of the same coin. You've given us a lot of time today, and 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 I really really do appreciate it. And and I think that uh, it's nine forty five, and your day began in the wee hours of the morning, preparing for a course that you teach at Columbia University. I think you had two or three other presentations. You know, we have so many questions. I have so many questions for you. I think we're just going to have to bring you back again. Maybe tomorrow we'll bring you back. Howard, but, but, but I, you know, I had questions about geopolitics and about China and your take on what's going on in, in, in Ukraine right now. Um, but, but I think, you know, I, I really think that we should, we should wrap things up and allow you to, uh, to get some sleep so you can play that tennis game that you're, 
planning for from morning tomorrow. Uh, I've got to get dinner first, but um, <laughs> I, I appreciate that, Adrian. <laughs> Howard, it's been it's been a delight. Thank you so much for for spending you know the, the last couple of hours with us, but but also thank you for uh, challenging us, and thank you for you know giving us the tools to kind of interrogate the way in which we understand this world of ours. Uh, and, and thank you for also providing us with an example of what is possible, uh, because I think that your career is a testament to a certain kind of commitment, a certain kind of audacity, a certain kind of excellence. And, and I think that, uh, you know, your example is certainly one that uh, we cherish and, and, and that we appreciate. So thank you so much, Howard, for your contribution tonight. Really appreciate it. I, I thank you, Adrian. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, see you all uh, who are in the audience in person. Uh, but thank you for participating in this way. And and uh, let's hope there's another opportunity to, do, to continue the conversation. I look forward to it. Thanks again, Howard. Thank Take you. Care. All the best. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so that brings us to the end of this event. Uh, this is the, the second event that we did as part of our uh, Black History Month celebration at the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton. Uh, we would like to thank, of course, our partners in this endeavor tonight. We'd like to thank the Institute of African Studies at Carleton University. Uh, we would also like to thank the Norman Patterson uh, School of International Affairs. Um, we'd also like to thank, oh, I have a couple of other people to thank. Let me just make sure that I have it all here. Uh, we'd li like to thank the uh, Bachelor of Global and International Studies as well uh, for their contributions uh, this evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you to the Faculty of Public Affairs. Uh, and thank you, to, thanks to you. Thank you, our audience, for your uh, questions and for your comments and, and just generally for your engagement this evening. It really was a, an extraordinary evening and we look forward to meeting with, meeting with you again in the not too distant future. Thanks so much. Take care. Have a good night. Good night.